So we're on the holiness of the church. Okay. So number 27.36, objection three, often the church of Rome has fallen into perversity of morals. Oh, this is very common. Therefore, by reason of its members, it cannot be said to be holy. The antecedent is proved by numberless examples. It is certain that Alexander VI and other Roman pontiffs were of corrupt morals. The clergy at the beginning of the 16th century had turned away from the gospel. The religious orders have not been worthy of their founders. Lay people have been filled with vices. Response. In general, I distinguish the antecedent. Often the perversity of this type is seen in many people in the church. I concede in the church itself, I deny. That sinners are found in the Roman church does not contradict our thesis in any way. In this field, by the teaching of Christ, the weeds and the wheat grow all the way to the harvest. All right, so in itself, it does not affect the holiness of the church. But these three things must be considered. One, that the morals are not corrupted in virtue of Catholic doctrine, but rather in absolute repugnance of Catholic doctrine. So it's not, it's not as if the Catholic church condones those things. Uh, or recommends those things. Two, even in the worst of times, there were examples of the most outstanding virtue and, and of many who had hearts which were clean of vices. So, uh, by the way, the Alexander the uh, Sixth, you know, he's, oh, they drag him out all the time. He, all of the dirt alleged against him was written by a single person who was a gossip column priest who hated the Borgias. And it was very typical. And this you can read this in a book. It's in the library called The Borgias by a Protestant author, but somebody who's not Catholic. And he, he, he says there's, there's no other evidence and there's no previous evidence for him to be have been immoral. He was uh, ambassador to Spain. There was no... Uh, uh, immorality recorded in, in any of his past. And uh, so it's, it, there's an interesting section in that book if you want to read it. So the, the, uh, the Borgias were hated uh, by the Italians. See, they were Spanish. And they were detested by some Italians. But you know, the, so there was, uh, but it, Renaissance Italy was just known for all sorts of intrigue and and uh, gossip, um, I mean, pretty much the Italian newspapers today, it, it, everything is all the corruption in the government, and you know that's the main thing is corruption in the government, who's on the take, and this and that and the other thing. They, they they have a tendency to to be interested in those things, you know. So anyway, this this. Um, uh, uh, so this one priest who was uh, detested the Borgias wrote all of that about him and there's no other evidence to support it so anyway that's Alexander VI but it would be good to read that in order to, to answer that because everybody drags out Alexander VI and actually in many ways as far as the government of the church and the government of the papal states he was very good All right, so in any case, but there have been, I mean, uh, uh, other popes, uh, especially in the, in the uh, 10th century, you had some immoral popes. Uh, the, you had um, the general morality of the clergy in Germany in, in the 1400s was very bad. Uh, in Italy, it was not very good. In England, it was good. But, uh, you know, it wasn't universal, but Germany was particularly bad. Uh, and um, so, uh, you know, was Luther scandalized by that? Of course. Was he scandalized by all the worldliness in Rome? There was plenty of worldliness in Rome. Uh, Rome was overtaken by humanism uh, that, uh, um, you know, the, you see it in the art and, um, I think I told you that it's Sixtus the Fourth was the big humanist. He's like 1470s around there, 1480s. Sixtus the Fourth. He is famous for the Sistine Chapel. 
I forget his family name, but he was one of the big ones. Sixth is the fourth. All right. He had carved in bronze, uh, probably cast in bronze, uh, for himself a a big plate to go upon his a tremendous thing. It was probably, I've seen it, it's in the Vatican Museum, it's probably eight feet by 12 feet easily, all bronze. It's like a big thing that would sit on top of a, of a tomb. Yeah. And, it, and that is called the uh, Renaissance Manifesto by artists. There is not a single sacred image on that thing. It's all classicism. Not a single cross or sacred image, not an angel, not a saint, all classical figures. That is indicative of what was going on in Rome at the time. The the love of classicism and you know the uh, all of this uh, uh, revival of of Roman you know uh, uh, Roman classicism Greek too but mostly Roman the, and so Rome was it was in the 1400s with some exceptions uh, corrupt it worldly. Um, uh, uh, clerics committing fornication, etc. One book said, I don't know if it's true or not, but the, the mistresses would show up at ceremonies with the cardinals next to them. That's how bad it was. So it was corrupt. Not doctrinally corrupt. It was never that. But, the, but uh, morally corrupt and worldly. Um, it was, uh, like Leo the Tenth, who loved to hunt, and you know, they, it, it is where they they were practically like um, uh, he was a, he was a Medici, uh, enjoying life too much, you might say. Not, I mean, he was never what you call immoral, but parties and and worldly entertainments and distractions when Pius V was elected he got rid of everything like that he ran the apostolic palace like a monastery it was none of that uh and uh but up to that time there was uh there was nepotism you know the 1400s were not good so uh, there definitely is an accusation that is true there, but Alexander the Sixth uh, does not probably does not qualify for that. But so it is true, uh, you know, some of it. But at the same time, at that period, you had some very great saints in the 1400s. Uh, one of them, Saint Philip, uh, Saint. Uh, oh, what's his name? Yes, Saint Philip Neri. Uh, who as a young man was uh, very scandalized by the, the state of Rome and uh, uh, thought highly of Savonarola, who was, uh, uh, right to the end of his life he did, even though Savonarola was burned, uh, the, um, uh, because he, he accused Alexander VI of heresy, which was just not true. Um, the, uh, you know, he believed all the immorality, but he, because of that he... he Accuse him of heresy, which is just was not true. So, so, uh, but nonetheless, Savonarola was fighting in Florence against all of the humanism. Uh, Michelangelo is typical of the humanistic uh, developments in Florence. Florence was a place of a lot of money. It was the banking center of Europe, and uh, people were rich there. It was also a place of a lot of vice, <laughs> money and vice usually go together. And so there was this interest in, in reviving all of the Roman stuff, and so there was a whole school of art. The old school of art was Fra Angelico. He was, he was Flo, uh, Florentian. Uh, 
and you see the very, very pious pictures by, he, he was mid-1400s, absolutely pious, piety was, you know, everybody's clothed. Uh, then Michelangelo, uh, everybody, no one has clothes on, all right? And then you have these women that have biceps, it looks like them. I, mean, I don't think a woman is even capable of having biceps that he put on those women. Do you ever look at some of his figures? Like they've been to the gym, you know, the, the, they could be Olympic weightlifters. Why people think that's a beautiful thing, I'll never know, but they, they do. You know, so er everything is nudity, everything is man, you know, and even the, the pictures of the prophets and all, they're all just, looks like classical figures, classical gods, you know, they, but they, and then he calls them Isaiah or something. You know, that was the new way. And Savonarola, uh, in the you know 1490s, he gathered up all of those paintings and burned them in the piazza in Florence. <laughs> so, so he was he knew that Florence was becoming corrupt. But that whole spirit of the Renaissance was very very bad, and it did influence the, some of the clergy. But there were at the same time some very great saints in that period. So. Uh, that said, um, so number three, the vitality of the church has prepared new helps always for its members by which it has overcome the iniquity of the times. So you had coming out of that and coming out of the Lutheranism, you had the Tridentine period, which was a, a, a tremendous, you'd say, revival of sanctity in the Catholic Church. I mean, just a like a torrent of sanctity. In the, like it had never seen before. See, so the, so the, the, the question for the holiness of the church is, are its doctrines, its morals, its uh, everything about it holy, and do they lead to holiness? Are its commandments holy? Uh, that is what you're looking at. Are, do some people defect from those? Absolutely, they do. But that does not affect the holiness of the church. The point is that if you follow the rule book, you're going to get holy. That's the holiness of the church. And many do. You know, in other words, there's, there's many, many pious Catholics. And... Uh, um, you know, it's not as if the whole church is just a lot of immorality. So, but, you know, the, the dirt always shines out more than the, the, the virtue for people who are looking for it. So, um, responding to each objection uh, singly, one concerning what has been said about the Roman pontiff, I distinguish there were very few evil pontiffs, let it pass, that, that there were many I deny. Let us concede that Alexander the VI fell seriously into vice. So he concedes that, but I don't think it's true. But even if we should concede this, the sanctity of the Roman church is not extinguished. First, even those pontiffs who are alleged to have been the worst have preserved intact the sanctity of doctrine. Something which cannot be said of the Vatican II popes, in quotation marks. In other words... No, they're, well, we, who knows, but they don't appear to be uh, immoral with regard to m impurity, but far worse, they, they pervert the, the doctrine of the faith. Second, with a few exceptions, the Roman pontiffs were righteous men, and in most of them there was an evident great uprightness of life with the effect that the apostolic see by far exceeded all other royal families and sanctity. Third, some men from among the Protestants themselves, more desirous of truth than of making reproaches and accusations, have answered by absolutely certain documents the false accusations against the Roman pontiffs, such as Voigt in Gregorius VII and Friedrich Herter in Innocentius III. And that, that the Borgias, it's in the library. Concerning what they say about the clergy, or the religious orders and lay people I distinguish. In these there is not seen holiness absolutely, I concede relatively, I deny. 
The founder of the church predicted that there would be evil people even in the church, and the clerical state is not such that it is impossible that there be imperfection in it. So you don't become a saint by getting ordained or by taking vows. You become a saint by living up to your ordination and living up to your vows. Nevertheless, the Roman church does not cease to be brilliant by the holiness of its members relatively. In it, heroic examples of innocence and penance are always perceived. In the worst times, the Roman church has, by its own vitality, produced the effect that it supplies for a declining discipline by a salutary reformation of morals. Reformers of this type dedicated themselves according to the heart of God, St. Benedict, St. Gregory VII, St. Bernard, St. Francis, and St. Dominic. And when Luther revolted, St. Ignatius, St. Francis de Sales, St. Charles Borromeo, St. Pius V, and others all the way to, to Pius X, whose motto of life is Instaurare Omnia in Christo. He was not canonized at the time, but he's among those saints. See, so the, the church writes itself all the time. If there's any kind of corruption or decline, there's a, a, a writing of it. Objection four, Catholic nations are known to be inferior to Protestant nations with regard to morality. Therefore, sanctity cannot be said to be a mark of the Roman church. The antecedent is clear from the fact that, for example, Prussia and England exceed France, Spain, and Italy in regard to morals. In response, I distinguish the antecedent. Catholic nations are inferior in morals to Protestant nations inasmuch as they have abandoned the Catholic faith, let it pass. Inasmuch as Catholic nations retain the Catholic faith, I deny. Those who object to these things are mixing what is false with what is true. For this reason, I will include certain facts which are obvious in this place. One, the abundance and increase of material goods and military discipline are connected by many causes. Nor is it licit to measure Christian sanctity by goods of this type. And does truth follow the emperors? Yesterday, Napoleon, today, Moltke, and tomorrow, Oyama. Not Obama, but Oyama. All right. Moltke. This is the original Moltke, not the, his son was the one famous in uh, World War I. So he's talking about the original Moltke, uh, known as, uh, um, yes, Moltke the Younger, was a nephew of Field Marshal Count Moltke. Okay, maybe so. And served as the chief of the German general staff from 1906 to 1914. 1848 to 1916. Yes, okay. Uh, there was an older Molka, yeah, so. Uh, and Tamaro Oyama. So he was a Japanese field marshal and one of the founders of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Now this, uh, this may have been in relation to the defeat of the Russians in the Far East. The Russian Navy took, uh, I think it was 1904. The Russian Navy took a terrible defeat at the hands of the Japanese in 1904 and led to the revolutions, revolutionary movements of 1905. That was the famous case where the socialists at the, uh, led by a socialist Russian Orthodox priest uh, and who were armed, uh, made a, a peaceful demonstration in front of the Winter Palace and were shot upon after they shot first in the air they were shot upon because they were approaching armed to the winter palace and the cossacks shot them and then it was the same thing as you know blm and all of that you know oh how terrible oh how awful terrible awful they were making they were armed people that were going to so that's so then the 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 czar had to uh he did not actually approve it. He said they shouldn't have done that afterwards. He was away. But the, uh, the, uh, you know, then it was uh, excuse for revolution. Uh, Russia was rife with revolutionary activity even in the late 19th century. Rife. Tolstoy, for example.
He was a revolutionist, uh, socialist. Um, Dostoyevs Dostoevsky. Um, uh, there were all of these little Soviets. They didn't call them Soviets yet, but these little self-appointed uh, committees all around Russia uh, preparing the way for Bolshevism already back in the 1890s. So it was all, they were just waiting in the wings for an opportunity, that's all. So, the, but that is portrayed as this terrible, terrible thing. And, uh, and you know, it was an unfortunate thing, but you do have to keep order. See, so, and when the leftists fired, you know, when Napoleon fired on the monarchists, on the standing on the steps of Saint Roch in Paris, he was promoted. He, he cannon fire and killed them all. He got promoted. So when the left does it, oh, it's okay. You know, those people are terrible people. But the when the you know anybody in, on the right side keeps order by gunfire, then then you know it's just, this is just the end of the world. This is terrible, and it's got to go. Yesterday, where there was that, uh, or on the weekend, there was that uh, man that ran over five people in a Christmas parade, killed the five people, and injured 40, including 12 children, in a Christmas parade in a town in Wisconsin. And he was an anti Trump, Trump black man. All right. Now, if that had been a pro-Trump white man that did that? Could you imagine what, what we would be hearing? He, he was a rapper that had songs against Trump. And you know, nothing is being said, how, nothing at all, you know, just, well, you know, that's the way it is, you know, just another incident. If that had been the opposite, we would hear about it for the next three months. You know, all of this right wing, you know, all this running over children. going 40 miles an hour through a parade because he had just had a fight with his girlfriend. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's whatever way you see it. Uh, so, objection, uh, so the, um, so Oyama, uh, so Neo-Judaism does not excel among uh, religions for the fact that this category of people is the richest. See, so there's the uh, Judaism, he's saying, is not popular, even though they are the richest people. Very often we see also that material prosperity of modern nations does not in any way coincide with the progress of Christian life. Right? And to say that England is, was, had greater morals, well, you know, when, when you have divorce, if you don't count divorce as immorality, well, then sure. And I would never, I mean, if you look at some of the, the so-called morals of the Victorian era, I mean, England was no better than anybody else and probably a lot worse. And, you know, that, that's just with regard to sexual immorality, but also with regard to... Uh, uh, the cruel way in which they uh, treated their subjects in Africa and in India and in various other places. They, they, they were never known for you know, high virtue. <laughs> so, to the adversar adversaries, do not prove that in those nations which are called by them non-Catholic, more is, is done for God and from love of Jesus Christ by non-Catholics than in the Catholic nations by those who have preserved the Catholic faith. In the nations of Catholics, the failing morals has corresponded to failing faith. So, you know, France was completely, he's talking about France about 1900. Yes, it's living under the Third Republic, the Freemasonic Third Republic. The, the country has repudiated the established faith, the Catholic faith. Absolutely. The same was true in Spain, where, where there were many revolutions in the 19th century, uh, which uh, weakened a great deal the Catholic faith in Spain. Um, uh, Italy was all 
uh, under the Freemasonic governments of, of Savoy and uh, so forth. I mean, all of those countries were ruined by these these terrible movements uh, as a result of the French Revolution uh, and, and you know, the effects of that in the 19th century. So those are the big Catholic countries of Europe, and and they were they had their faith ruined. Furthermore, we should not forget in any way if at times there is seen a collapse of one or another people, what Pius IX said, it must be lamented very greatly that it is not certain that this or that nation will always preserve that most precious treasure of our divine faith and religion. See, so the fact that you receive the gospel doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to perpetually retain it. So, in Catholic nations, although they have been oppressed for many years under the domination of secret societies, nevertheless are brilliant by the worship of God and by many indications of Christian and supernatural virtue. So, even despite the Freemasonic governments of Spain, of France, and Italy, just to take those, in the 19th century, there was a great deal of piety. Uh, you can see it in the building of their churches and, and various other uh, indications of piety, people in, at mass, people practicing their faith, etc. You see saints, St. John Bosco, for example, in Italy. You see uh, uh, Catherine Labore in France and various other saints in France uh, in the 19th century. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of piety in those countries, but the establishment of the religion was gone. In other words, the piety was low down, you might say. In other words, it was at, among the people who were still retaining the Catholic faith. Uh, but upstairs, it was terrible. Upper classes, middle class to a great extent. Uh, government. Even uh, Austria-Hungary gave the church an awful lot of trouble in the 19th century, because particularly Hungary. Um, and Franz Josef was no prize himself. He went along with the whole thing. Um, among uh, non-Catholics, religion is weak. Heroic sacrifices for God are perceived much less nor does it appear in any way that sins are not commonly found. So they are by no means uh, paradises of virtue. Six, if we measure by public statistics of morals the Catholic religion rather than imperfectly measuring it, it will appear sufficiently from it that statistics of this type by their very nature do not refer to the direction of human acts to their ultimate end. In fact, they are entirely silent concerning internal vices and sins, which in most cases are not subject to the penal code. They hardly ever make any allowance for circumstances in the estimation of the moral status of the delinquents. They do not take into consideration actions which are virtuous in the sight of God and Christ, namely humility, sincerity of a contrite heart, piety, and other numberless virtues. According to the statistics, the Pharisee goes down to his house justified, but in the gospel, uh, it is the publican who is justified. So he's saying that merely external morality is not enough. The statistical numbers are collected according to different, a, a different norm from the, that norm of the gospel, according to which the harlot shall go into the kingdom of God before you. Among non-Catholics, the most wicked principles are propagated. The Roman Church has holy principles and the power of preserving them with the greatest uh, calamity of times. So the, the, uh, uh, the Protestants have the principle of faith alone. So you, we're all sinners and, and all you need is faith. That's an evil principle. The, the Catholic faith says you're going to go to hell if you die impenitent in mortal sin. Uh, see the encyclicals of Leo the Thirteenth, especially Sapientia Christiana. However, it is evident both from the nature of things and from the history of all centuries that there is a perpetual hope of resurrection in such principles, from which it happens that in the Catholic Church 
morals are always reborn. So that is part of it is the history of the Catholic Church that no matter what happened to it, either from inside or outside, there was either external persecutions or interior corruption of morals, it always bounced back. It always overcame it. And it's one of the, the proofs of its, of its divine assistance because if, if it had not been divinely assisted, uh, it would have gone out of existence a thousand years ago easily, more. more than that. It would never have persevered. It would never have been able to be totally consistent in teaching. It never contradicted itself in Doctrine, never, not once. And you see, when the authority is taken away, <laughs> what happens? People dispute about what the doctrine is. And, and the, it, it shows the necessity of the authority and also the assistance that is given to the church to preserve the doctrine. Okay.